disintegrated, retreated. But they reformed in an alley near the factory, amid a gang of staring children, and the women from the mute collared the children and sent them running to get milk, cow's milk, goat's milk, anything they could find, and the mute organizers had rinsed their eyes with the milk, holding their faces still while they coughed and gagged. The fat-soluble CS gas rinsed away, leaving them teary but able to see, and the coughs dispersed, and someone produced a bag of charcoal filter cycling masks, and someone else had a bag of swimming goggles, and the women put them on and pulled their hijabs over their noses, over the masks, so that they looked like some species of snouted animal, and they reformed their line and marched back, chanting their slogans. The police gassed them again, but this time, the picket captains were able to hold the line, to send brave women forward to grab the smoking canisters and throw them back over police lines. For a moment, it looked like the police would charge, but the strikers and the organizers had been feeding a photo stream to the internet using mobile phones that tunneled through the national firewall, getting them up on the human rights wires, and so the Ministry of Labor was getting phone calls from the foreign press, and they were on the phone to the Ministry of Justice, and the police withdrew. The first skirmish was over, and the strikers settled in for a long siege. No one got in or out of the factory without being harangued by hundreds of young women, shoving literature detailing their working conditions and grievances and demands through the windows of their cars and buses. Some replacement workers got in. Some picked fights, some turned around and left. A unionized trucker refused to cross their line, and wouldn't take away the load he'd been charged with picking up, so it just sat there on the docks. The days turned into weeks, and they fed their families as best as they could with the strike pay, which came to a third of what they'd earned in the plant, but the factory owners, a subsidiary of a Dutch company, were hurting too. The mute organizers explained that the parent company had to release its quarterly statement to its shareholders, who would demand to know why this major factory was sitting idle instead of making money. The organizers offered confident reassurances that when this happened, the workers' demands would be met the strike settled, and they could get back to work. So they hung in there. Keeping their spirits up on the line, and then. The factory closed. Big Sister Nor found out about it one night as she was playing Theater of War 7, a game she'd played since she was a little girl. One of her guildies was a girl whose brother had passed by the factory on his way home from school, and he'd seen them moving the machines out of the plant, driving away in huge lorries. She'd texted everyone she knew. Get to the factory now, but by the time they got there, the factory was dead, empty, the gates chained shut. No one from the union met them. None of them answered her calls. And the women she'd called sister, the women who'd saved her when she'd said enough, they all looked to her and said. What do we do now? And she hadn't known. She'd managed to hold the tears in until she got home, but then they'd flowed, and her parents, who doubted her and harangued her every step of the way, scolded her for her foolishness, told her it was her fault that all her friends were jobless. She'd lain in bed that night, miserable, and had been woken by the soft chirp of her phone. I'm outside. It was Effendi, the mute organizer she'd been closest to. Come to the door. She'd crept outside on Kat's feet and barely had time to make out Effendi's outline before she collapsed into Noor's arms. She had been beaten bloody, her eyes blacked. Two of her fingers broken, her lips mashed and one of her teeth missing. She managed a mangled smile and whispered. It's all part of the job. The cheap hotel where the four organizers had shared a room was raided just after dinner, the police taking them away. They'd been prepared for this, had lawyers standing by to help them when it happened, but they didn't get to call lawyers. They didn't go to the jailhouse. Instead, they'd been taken to a shantytown behind the main train station and three policemen had stood guard while a group of private security forces from the plant had taken turns beating them with truncheons and fists and boots, screaming insults at them, calling them whores, tearing at their clothes, beating their breasts and thighs. It only stopped when one of the women fell unconscious, bleeding from a head wound, eyelids fluttering. The men had fled then, after taking their money and identity papers, leaving them weeping and hurt. Effendi had managed to hide her spare mobile phone, a tiny thing the size of a matchbook, in the elastic of her underpants. And that had enabled her to call the mute headquarters for help. Once the ambulance was on its way. She'd come to get Nor. They'll probably come for you, too, she said. They usually try to make an example of the workers who start trouble. But you told me that they were going to have to give in because of their shareholders. Dash quote dot. Effendi held up a broken hand. 
I thought they would. But they decided to leave. We think they're probably going to Indonesia. The new laws there make it much harder to organize the workers. That's how it goes, sometimes. She shrugged, then winced and sucked air over her teeth. We thought they'd want to stay put here. The provincial government gave them too much to come here, tax breaks, new roads, free utilities for five years. But there are new special economic zones in Indonesia that have even better deals. She shrugged again, winced again. You may be all right here, of course. Maybe they'll just move on. But I thought you should be given the chance to get somewhere safe with us, if you wanted to. Nor shook her head. I don't understand. Somewhere safe. The union has a safe house across the provincial line. We can take you there tonight. We can help you find work, get set up. You can help us unionize another factory. A light rain fell, pattering off the palms that lined her street and splashing down in wet, fat drops, bringing an earthy smell up from the soil. A fat drop slid off an unseen leaf overhead and spattered on Noor's neck, reminding her that she'd gone out of the house without her hijab, something she almost never did. It seemed to her an omen, like her life was changing in every single way. Where are we going? You find out when we get there. I don't know either. That's why it's a safe house, no one knows where it is unless they have to. Mute organizers have been murdered, you understand. Why didn't you tell me this when all this started? she wanted to say. But her parents had told her. Management had warned them, through bullhorns, that they were risking everything. She'd laughed at them, filled with the feeling of sisterhood and safety, of power. That feeling was gone now. And she'd gone with Effendi, and she'd worked in a factory that was much like the factory she'd left, and there had been a union fight much like the one she'd fought, but this time, they were better prepared and the workers had called nor big sister, a term of endearment that had scared her a little, coming from the mouths of women much older than her, coming from young girls who could never appreciate the danger. And this time, the owners hadn't fled, the workers had won better conditions, and big sister nor found that she didn't want to make textiles anymore. She found that she had a taste for the fight. Now there was a young man, someone called Matthew Fong, in Shenzhen, and he was relying on her to help him win his dignity, fair wages, and a safe and secure workplace. And he was doing it in China, where unofficial unions were illegal and where labor organizers sometimes disappeared into prison for years. The mighty Krang could speak a beautiful Mandarin as well as his native Cantonese, so he was in charge of giving sound bites to the foreign Chinese press, that network of news resources serving the hundreds of millions of people of Chinese ancestry living abroad. They were key, because they were intimately connected to the whole sprawling enterprise of imports and exports, and when they spoke, the bureaucrats in Beijing listened. And the mighty Krang could put on a voice that was so smoothly convincing you'd swear it was a newscaster. Just Bob was in charge of moral support for the strikers. Talking to them in broken Cantonese and Singlish and Gamer speak on conference calls, keeping their morale up. She could work three phones and two computers like a human octopus, her attention split across a dozen conversations without losing the thread in any of them. And big sister Noor. She was in world, in several worlds, rallying Webleys to the site of the Mushroom Kingdom, finding gamers converging from all over Asia, where it was night, and from Europe, where it was day, and America, where it was morning. Management had wasted no time moving replacement workers in. There were always desperate subcontractors out in the provinces of China, ten kids in a dead industrial town in Dongbei who'd been lured to computers with pretty talk about getting paid to play. Across a dozen different shards of the same Mushroom Kingdom world, a dozen alternate realities, they came, and Big Sister Noor played general in a skirmish against them, as strikers blocked the entrance to the dungeon and sent a stream of pro-union chats and URLs to them even as they fought them to keep them out of the dungeon. The battle wasn't much of a fight. Not at first. The replacement workers were there to kill dumb non-player characters in a boring predictable way that wouldn't trigger the mechanical Turks and bring their operation to the attention of Nintendo Sun. They were all seasoned gamers, and they were used to team play, and many of the Webleys had never fought side by side before. But the Webleys were fighting for the movement, and the replacement workers, they called them, scabs, another old word from out of history, were fighting because they didn't know what else to do. It was a rout. The scabs were sent back to their respawn points by the thousand, unable to return to work until they'd done their corpse runs, and the Webleys raised their swords and shot fireballs into the sky and cheered in a dozen languages. 
The news was good from Shenzhen, too, judging from what Just Bob was saying into her headsets and typing onto her screens. The strike line was holding, and while the police were there, they hadn't moved in, in fact, it sounded like they'd moved to hold back the private factory security. Silently. Big Sister Noor thanked Matthew Fong for picking a fight that, seemingly, they'd be able to win. She shouted up to Easy Hill in the front of Headshot, calling for ginseng bubble tea all around, the ginseng root would give them all a little shot of energy. Couldn't live on caffeine and taurine alone. Easy Hill, she shouted a minute later, looking up from her mouse. Bubble tea. If she'd been paying attention. She would have noticed the squeak in his voice as he promised right away, right away. But her attention was fixed on her screens, because that's where it was all suddenly going very wrong indeed. What she'd taken for Stryker's victorious fireballs launched into the sky were landing among the players now, inflicting major damage. Just as she was noticing this, a volley of skidding, spiked turtle shells came sliding in from off-screen, in twelve worlds at once. Ambush. She barked the word into her headset in Mandarin, then Cantonese, then Hindi, then English. The cry was taken up by the players and they rallied, forming battle squares, healers in the middle, tanks on the outside, nimble thieves and scouts spreading out into the mushroom forests, looking for the ambush. This would work much better if they were a regular guild, all playing on the side of the evil Bowser or of the valiant Princess Peach, because if you were all on the same side, the game would coordinate your movements for you, give you radar for where and how all the other players were moving. But the strikers were from both sides of Mushroom Kingdom's moral coin, and as far as the game was concerned, they were sworn enemies. Their IMs were unintelligible to one another, and the default option for any opposing avenue you clicked on was attack, leading to a lot of accidental skirmishes. But gold farmers knew all about playing their own game, one that lived on top of the game that the companies wanted them to play. The game's communications tools were powerful and easy, but nothing, apart from the ridiculous agreement you had to click every time you started up the game, kept you from using anything you wanted. They favored free chat systems developed to help corporate work groups collaborate, since these services always had free demo versions available, hoping to snag some office person into buying 30.000 licenses for their megacorp. These systems even allowed them to stream screen caps from their own computers, and Big Sister nor saw to it that these were arranged sequentially, forming a huge, panoramic view of the entire battlefield. She flicked through the battle scenes and the communications hub, fingers flying on the keyboard. They had a Koopa Turbo Hammer in Seven of the Worlds, a huge, whirling god hammer that could clobber a score of attackers on a single throw, and she had it brought forward, using the scout's screencaps to pinpoint the enemy's positions, conferring them to the hammer throwers, a passel of hulking kongs with protruding fangs and enormous, hairy chests. That was seven battles down, in the remaining five, she ordered the peaches to form up with their umbrellas at the ready, then had two Bowsers, bounce, each of them, sticking to them while doing minimum damage. The peaches unfurled their umbrellas and sailed into the air, taking their Bowsers with them, to drop behind enemy lines, ready to breathe fire and stomp the opposing forces. This was a devastating attack, one that was only possible if you played the farmer's game, cooperating through a side channel, normally. Bowsers and Princess Peaches were on the opposite sides of the Great War that was at the center of the Mushroom Kingdom story. It should have worked, the Hammers, the Bowsers, the skilled players of a dozen guilds, bristling with armament and armor, spelling and firing and skirmishing. It should have worked, but it hadn't. The mysterious attackers, she'd branded them Pinkertons in her mind. After the strike-breaking goons from the Pinkerton Detective Agency who'd been the old Wobbly's worst enemies, had seemingly endless numbers, and every attack they launched seemed to do maximum damage. Meanwhile, they were able to pull off incredible dodges and defenses against the strikers' attacks. And their aim. Every fireball. Every turtle. Every sound bomb, every flung axe found its target with perfect accuracy. It was almost as though they were. Cheating. That had to be it. They were using aim hacks. Dodge hacks. All the prohibited add-on software that the game was supposed to be able to spot and disable. Somehow, they'd gotten past the game's defenses. It didn't matter. The game was always stacked against gold farmers. Pull back, she shouted. Retreat. This was going to have to be guerrilla war, jungle war, hiding in the bushes and sniping at them as they'd sniped at her. 
She'd lure them into the clearing that marked the dungeon's entrance and then they'd slip around them into the mushroom forest, using their superior coordination to trump the hacks and numbers the Pinkertons had on their side. In her headset, she heard the ragged breathing, the curses in six languages, the laughter and shouting of players all over the world, listening to her rap out commands in all the different versions of Mushroom Kingdom that they were fighting in. She found that she was grinning. This was fun. This was a lot more fun than being tear gassed. It had been Big Sister Noor's idea to use the games for organizing. Why risk your neck in the factory or standing at its gates when you could slip right in among the workers, no matter where they were in the world, and talk to them about joining up? Plenty of the mute old guard had thought she was crazy, but there was lots of support, too, especially when Noor showed them that they could reach the Indonesian textile workers who'd inherited her job when her factory had closed up and moved on, simply by logging into Spirals of the Golden Snail, a game that had taken the whole Malay Peninsula by storm. It didn't matter where you fought, it mattered whether you won. And the more she thought about it, the more she realized that they could win in-game. The bosses were better at firing tear gas at them, but they were better at lobbing fireballs, pulsed energy weapons, photon torpedoes and savage flying fish, and they always would be. What's more, a striker who lost a skirmish in-game merely had to respawn and do a corpse run, possibly losing a little inventory in the process. A striker who lost a skirmish AFK, away from keyboard, might end up dead. Big Sister Noor lived in perpetual fear of having someone's death on her hands. The battle was turning again. The Pinkertons had all fallen for her gambit, letting them rush past and back into the mushroom forest, effectively trading places. Now they were digging in the woods, laying little ambushes, fortifying positions and laying down withering fire from all directions. The breathing, gasping, Triumphant muttering voices in her head and the hastily clattered in-game chat gave her a feeling like the battle was resting delicately balanced on her fingertips, every shift and change dancing felt as a tremor against the sensitive pads of her fingers. Big Sister Noor called for her bubble tea again, realizing that a very long time indeed had gone by since she'd first ordered it. This time, no one answered. The skin on the back of her neck prickled and she slipped her headphones off her head. Just Bob and the mighty Krang caught on a second later, removing their earwigs. There was no noise at all from the front of Headshot, none of the normal hyperactive calling of gamer kids, or the shouts of guestworkers phoning home on cheap earwigs. Big Sister Nor stood up quietly and quickly and backed up against the wall, motioning to the others to do the same. On her screen, she saw another rally by the Pinkertons, who'd taken advantage of the sudden lack of strategic leadership to capture several of the small striker strongholds. She inched her way toward the door and very, very, very slowly tilted her head to see around the frame, then whipped it back as quick as she could. Run, she mouthed to her lieutenants, and they broke for the rear entrance, the escape hatch that Big Sister Nor always made sure of before she holed up to do union work. On their heels came the Pinkertons, the real-world Pinkertons. Malay men in workers' clothes. Poor men, men armed with stout sticks and a few chains, men who'd been making their way to the door when Big Sister nor chanced to look around it. They shouted after them now, excited and tight voices, like the catcalls of drunken boys on street corners when they were feeling the bravery of numbers and hormones and liquor. That was a dangerous sound. It was the sound of fools egging each other on. Big Sister Noor hit the crash bar on the rear door with both palms. Slamming into it with the full weight of her body. The door's gas lift was broken. So it swung back like a mousetrap, and it was a good thing it did, because it moved so fast that the two Pinkertons waiting to bar their exit didn't have time to get out of the way. One was knocked over on his ass, the other was slammed into the cinderblock wall with a jarring thud that Big Sister Noor felt in her palms. The door rebounded into her. Knocking her back into the mighty Krang, who caught her, pushed her on, hands on her shoulder blades, breath ragged in her ears. They were in a dark, narrow, stinking alley behind that connected two of the Larangs, the small streets that ran off Galing Road, and it was time to R&G, to run and gun, what you did when all your other plans collapsed. Big Sister Noor had thought this through far enough to make sure they had a back door, but no farther than that. The Pinkertons were close behind, but they were all squeezed down into the incredibly narrow confines of the alleyway, and no one could really run or move faster than a desperate shuffle. 
But then they broke free into the next larang, and big sister nor broke left, hoping to make it far enough up the road to get into sight of the diners at the all-night restaurants. She didn't make it. One of the men threw his truncheon at her and it hit her square between her shoulders, knocking the breath from her and causing her to go down on one knee. Just Bob twined one hand in her blouse and hauled her to her feet with a sound of tearing cloth, and dragged her on, but they'd lost a step to her fall, and now the men were on them. Just Bob whirled around, snarling, shouting a worldless cry, using the movement as inertia for a wild roundhouse kick that connected with one of the Pinkertons, a man with sleepy eyes and a thick mustache. Just Bob's foot caught him in the side, and they all heard the sound of his ribs breaking under the toe of her demure sandal with its fake jewels. The sandal flew on and clattered to the road with the cheap sound of paste gems. The men hadn't expected that, and there was a moment when they stopped in their tracks, staring at their fallen comrade, and in that instant. Big Sister Nor thought that, just maybe, they could get away. But just Bob's chest was heaving, her face contorted in rage, and she leapt at the next man, a fat man in a sweaty sport coat, thumbs aiming at his eyes, and as she reached him, the man beside him lifted his truncheon and brought it down, glancing off her high, fine cheekbone and then smashing against her collarbone. Just Bob howled like a wounded dog and fell back, landing a hard punch in her attacker's groin as she fell back. But now the Pinkertons were on them, and their arms were raised, their truncheons held high, and as the first one swung into Big Sister Noor's left breast, she cried out and her mind was filled with Effendi and her broken fingers, her unrecognizably bruised face. Somewhere, just a few tantalizing meters up the Larang, night people were eating a huge feast of fish and goat in curry, the smells in the air. But that was there. Here. Big Cider Nor was infinitely far from them, and the truncheons rose and fell and she curled up to protect her head, her breasts, her stomach, and in so doing exposed her tender kidneys, her delicate short ribs, and there she lay, enduring a season in hell that went on for an eternity and a half. Hash. This scene is dedicated to Chapters, Indigo, the National Canadian Megachain. I was working at Baca, the independent science fiction bookstore, when Chapters opened its first store in Toronto and I knew that something big was going on right away, because two of our smartest, best informed customers stopped in to tell me that they'd been hired to run the science fiction section. From the start, Chapters raised the bar on what a big corporate bookstore could be, extending its hours, adding a friendly cafe and lots of seating, installing in-store self-service terminals and stocking the most amazing variety of titles. Chapters, Indigo. Connor Prickle sometimes thought of math as a beautiful girl, the kind of girl that he'd dreamt of wooing, dating, even marrying, while sitting in the back of any class that wasn't related to math. Daydreaming. A beautiful girl like Jenny Rosen, who'd had classes with him all through high school, who always seemed to know the answer no matter what the subject, who had a light dusting of freckles around her nose and a quirky half-smile. Who dressed in jeans that she'd tailored herself, in t-shirts she'd modded, stitching multiple shirts together to make tight little half-shirts, elaborate shawls, mocked her tailnecks. Jenny Rosen had seemed to have it all, beauty and brains and, above all, rationality, she didn't like the way that store-bought jeans fit, so she hacked her own. She didn't like the t-shirts that everyone wore, so she changed the shirts to suit her taste. She was funny, she was clever. And he'd been completely head over heels in love with her from sophomore English right through to senior American history. They'd been friendly through that time, though not really friends. Connor's friends were into gaming and computers. Jenny's friends were jocks and school paper kids. But friendly, sure, enough to say hello in the hallway, enough to become lab partners in sophomore physics. She was a careful taker of notes, and her hair stuff smelled amazing, and their hands brushed against each other a hundred times that semester. And then, in senior year, he'd asked her out to a movie. Then she'd asked him to a track rally. Then he'd asked her to work with him on an American history project on Chinese railway workers that involved going to Chinatown after school, and there they'd had a giant dim sum meal and then sat in a park and talked for hours, and then they'd stopped talking and started kissing. And one thing led to another, and the kissing led to more kissing, and then their friends all started to whisper. Did you hear about Connor and Jenny, and she met his parents and he met hers? And it had all seemed perfect. But it wasn't perfect. Anything but. In the four months, two weeks and three days that they were officially a couple, they had approximately 2.453.212 arguments, each more blazing than the last. 
Theoretically, he understood everything he needed to about her. She loved sports. She loved to use her mind. She loved humor. She loved silly comedies and slow music without words. And so he would go away and plan out exactly how to deliver all these things to her, plugging in her loves like variables into an equation, working out elaborate schemes to deliver them to her. But it never worked. He'd work it out so that they could go to a ball game at AT&T Park and she'd want to go see a concert at Cow Palace instead. He'd take her to see a new wacky comedy and she'd want to go home and work on an overdue assignment. No matter how hard he tried to get her reality and his theory to match up, he always failed. In his heart of hearts, he knew it wasn't her fault. He knew that he had some deficiency that caused him to live in the imaginary world he sometimes thought of as theory land, the country where everything behaved as it was supposed to. After graduation, through his bachelor's degree in pure math at Berkeley, his master's in signal processing at Caltech, and the first year of a PhD in economics at Stanford, he had occasion to date lots of beautiful women, and every time, he found himself ground to pulp between the gears of real world and theory land. He gave up on women and his PhD on a fine day in October, telling the professor who was supposed to be his advisor that he could find someone else to teach his freshman math courses, grade his papers, and answer his email. He walked off the Stanford campus and into the moneyed streets of Palo Alto, and he packed up his car and drove to his new job, as chief economist for Coca-Cola's games division, and finally, he found a real world that matched the beautiful elegance of Theoryland. Coca-Cola ran or franchised anywhere from a dozen to 30 game worlds at any given time. The number of games went up or down according to the brutal, elegant logic of the economics of fun, a certain amount of difficulty, plus, a certain amount of your friends, plus, a certain amount of interesting strangers, plus, a certain amount of reward, plus, a certain amount of opportunity, equaled, fun. That was the equation that had come to him one day early in his second semester of the Ph.D. grind, a bolt of inspiration like the finger of God reaching down into his brain. The magic was that equal sign. Just before the fun, because once you could express fun as a function of other variables, you could establish its relationship to those variables, if we reduce the difficulty and the number of your friends playing, can we increase the reward and make the fun stay the same? This line of thought drove him to phone in a sick call to his advisor and head straight home, where he typed and drew and scribbled and thought and thought and thought, and he phoned in sick the next day, and the next, and then it was the weekend, and he let his phone run down, shut off his email and IM, and worked, eating when he had to. By the time he found himself shoving fingerloads of butter into his mouth, having emptied the fridge of all else, he knew he was onto something. He called them the prickle equations, and they described inelegant. Pure, abstract math the relationship between all the variables that went into fun, and how fun equaled money, inasmuch as people would pay to play fun games, and would pay more for items that had value in those games. Technically, he should have sent the paper to his advisor. He'd signed a contract when he was accepted to the university giving ownership of all his ideas to the school forever.